I started reading the Bible, but I just got lost in all the genealogy. You know, who begot who. Who was Melchizedek? Where'd he come from? The book of Revelation just scares me. Does anybody really understand all those symbols? Who are the judges? Like, do they really matter? I've never understood which book came first. Is there a way to read the Bible so it makes sense? Welcome to our Father's Plan. It's good to have you with us once again. I'm Jeff Cavins, and I'm here with Dr. Scott Hahn from Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, a professor there teaching theology and Bible. And it's good to have you. Good to be here. Again. This has been a good series, hasn't it's it? It's been a lot of fun. We have, been, we have been discovering the treasures of our Father's plan as we've been reading through the Bible. And uh, we're going through our seventh and eighth period of, of salvation history out of 12 periods, this particular program. And the, uh, we've, we've covered Genesis, we've covered Exodus, we've covered Numbers, we've covered First and Second Samuel and uh, covered Joshua, Joshua and Judges. Joshua, Judges. And we're ready to go into the book of First Kings now, and we're going to be taking a look at a period in Israel's history. It's really a, it's a, it's kind of a dark period. It's the divided kingdom. It's where all of the, uh, the plans uh, of David seem to kind of come to an end, but I know they don't. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to look at the exile. If you're reading through the Bible with us using the 14 chronolog chronological uh, book approach, uh, we are right now on bead, the black bead. And that stands for Israel's darkest history. And the baby blue is Israel singing the blues in Babylon. Now, I know that's bad, but uh, this is just a memory device. And <laughs> say, if you would like to, to uh, get a hold of your own memory device, the Bible Timeline Band, you can just give EWTN a call, write them, and they'll tell you how you can obtain it. It's a memory device with a laminated card, some handouts to show you how to read through the Bible in chronological order, give you a plan to get into the Scriptures. But get into the Scriptures. Get into them. Don't just buy the Bible, but read it, right? Amen. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk uh, at the beginning of this program a little bit about the Bible as far as, uh, before we get into the, the historical aspect, how should we as Catholics view the Bible? Because, you know, when I grew up in the Catholic Church, uh, I don't remember a lot of people really encouraging me to read the Bible. I didn't get into it a, a whole lot. Uh, it wasn't until later on in my life that I got into the Bible. How should we view it? A lot of people seem to be afraid of it. They don't know whether they should be reading it themselves. They don't know how to interpret it. Give us some guidelines on this. Well, from the very beginning, we've emphasized how the Bible really consists of uh, letters, love letters that our Father writes us as His dearly beloved children. That is the theme echoed throughout this century by the popes and by Vatican II. You go all the way back to 1893 when Pope Leo XIII wrote an encyclical urging Catholics to read the Bible according to proper principles in Providentissimus Deus. And then 50 years later, Pope Pius XII issued really what many people call the Magna Carta of Catholic Scripture study, Divino Afflante Spiritu. And then in Vatican II, uh, what I think may be the most important document of uh, Vatican II was this dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum, which really sets out in clear terms how Catholics ought to read the Bible in terms of contemplation, but also in terms of application. And more recently, uh, the Pontifical Biblical Commission, uh, a body of consultants for the Pope, has issued a document entitled The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church. Now, it's not a magisterial document per se, but it ties many of the insights together from these earlier documents that are magisterial. And we find all of this in, in, in this new document, The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church, but perhaps uh, more readably, more digestively, we find it in the New Catechism. The Catechism the Catholic Church has a wonderful section on the interpretation of the Bible. A few basic principles that we ought to keep in mind. First of all, we're not just dealing with the Word of men. We're talking about the Word of God. So the Bible is inspired of God. That is, God is the principal author. The human writers are true authors, but they're instrumental authors. Uh, they write exactly what God wants them to write. They write what God wants to say and only what God wants to say. So we really speak of a mystery of inspiration, the mystery of dual 
authorship. God and the human writers are working together as the authors. And so the Bible is not just infallible, like the magisterium is infallible, or the tradition of the church is infallible. That is, it's incapable of teaching error and faith and morals. The Bible is an errant, which means that it is incapable of teaching error in faith and morals and history, not science. This is where we differ from the fundamentalists. The fundamentalist approach to the Bible would try to squeeze scientific facts from the Bible when the Bible is teaching us salvation history, when the Bible is displaying for us all the Father has done in his covenant plan for our salvation. So the Bible is inspired, the Bible is an errant, and so we have to approach the Bible with real reverence. But at the same time we approach it with reverence, we also have to approach it with uh, a studious attitude. We've got to get down on our knees, but we've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got to approach the Bible and study it. You know, I've heard it said that the Bible is, studying the Bible is uh, one part inspiration and 99 parts perspiration. You know, it takes a lot of hard work. But when we approach the Bible, we look at it in terms of the literal historical meaning. That isn't the same as a literalist approach, which again would try to squeeze science out of the text of the Bible. We're looking at it in literary terms, and so we use literary analysis to discern literary genres. Now in our series we're focusing on literary genre known as historical narrative. We're not focusing on the poetry, we're not focusing on the apocalyptic prophecies so much, we're not focusing on parables, all of that is exciting too, but the historical narrative gives us a specific literary genre which invites us to do what is called narrative analysis. We take the narrative as it stands in its final form and study all of the clues that are revealed in the narrative and not just the specific text before us. We study the text in its larger narrative context. So we're looking at, for instance, the Davidic covenant last time in terms of all of 1st and 2nd Samuel. But we don't stop there. The context reaches even farther out to encompass the entire canon of Scripture. So we interpret every text in its immediate context, but also in terms of its larger canonical context. That is, the context provided by the entire canon of Scripture. So we read the Old Testament in the light of the New, just as we read the New Testament as the fulfillment of the Old. And so, you know, when we read that document, for instance, the interpretation of the Bible in the church, it, it encourages Catholics to uh, do narrative analysis or what they sometimes call canonical criticism. These are techniques that we're employing throughout the series without discussing the methodology or the technical application of the principles. Some people would say that, that for example, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, that the Bible is filled with a lot of myths and we're not sure really what is myth and what is story. How do we sort that out as Catholics? How do we approach the scriptures? Well, we can acknowledge, frankly, that the biblical authors sometimes use certain mythical images. images. For instance, Isaiah uses Leviathan, Behemoth, great sea monsters and dragons and this sort of thing. Uh, but at the same time, the church has affirmed consistently down through the ages, but especially in the 20th century, that Genesis 1 to 11 presents us with salvation history. Mm -hmm. It isn't secular history as we would expect from modern historiography. So when we read it, we don't we don't find what a secular historian in the 20th century would recognize as history the way I do it. But it is genuine history. But it's the family story of God's children. That's good. It doesn't mean that we mythologize it though. It means that we recognize history being told here by God the Father through the Holy Spirit and through all of our spiritual fathers who handed these these stories down to us, but they're stories that happened. They're stories that are revealed for our salvation. They're not stories that we simply discount and criticize. We do employ historical critical methods in a sane and sober way, but within the context of faith, with a hermeneutic of faith, with an interpretive commitment to the faith as Christ gave it to the church and as the magisterium teaches it today. So we can really combine these approaches, and in fact, we must. And when we do, what we find is the Bible comes alive, not just in terms of the literal historical sense. If you look at the New Catechism, it says you got to go on. 
There is a historical sense or historical meaning, but at the same time, there is a spiritual meaning. Mm -hmm. And in another series sometime, I'd like to go into the Bible's spiritual meanings to do what is called spiritual exegesis with our audience, because that is where the Bible really comes to life in a contemplative and sacramental way for our worship. I just want to encourage you, uh, you're viewing this program and you're wondering whether you uh, can understand the Bible. We all, if you've never read the Bible before, we all start at ground zero. <laughs> you've got to start somewhere and just start reading the scriptures. Reading in chronological order is a good way to begin. Let me encourage you with this from the Catechism. The Catechism says, hence, this is uh, Article 131, hence, access to sacred scripture ought to be open wide to the Christian faithful. The church encourages you to get into the Bible and read it. You know what, we're going to be back in just a moment and we're going to get into uh, First Kings, the divided kingdom, and the exile. We'll be back right after this on Our Father's Plan. <laughs> Welcome back to Our Father's Plan. Well, we're about to enter into a very interesting period in Israel's history. It's called the Divided Kingdom. Now, in terms of our whole plan of salvation, we're studying 12 periods, and the Divided Kingdom is the seventh period. We'll also be looking at another period in the segment called the Exile, and that is period number eight. This comes on the heels of the United Kingdom period. Look with me on our chart behind me, and uh, we have these 14 historical books. We're going to be looking at First Kings today, which is our eighth of the 14 historical books. We're also going to be taking a look at Second Kings today. Let's just uh, take a moment and look at this chart for a second. We have here during 2 Samuel, which we just, we just uh, covered in our last segment, the United Kingdom. If you look below, we have Psalms. If you want to read the Bible in chronological order and get an idea of where the books fit in, it's a good idea to read the Psalms during 2 Samuel. These are the Psalms of David primarily, and it's really David's struggles in the midst of real life. And I think that you'll really be encouraged by reading those psalms. In the midst of First Kings, we have the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of, so uh, Song of Songs. And in Second Kings, which we're going to be covering also today in the period of the exile, we have many, many of the prophets, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. That's where a lot of people become very confused in reading the Bible. If you look over here on the chart, our Bible timeline, we are in the Divided Kingdom period. The Divided Kingdom period comes on the heels of the United Kingdom period. And then we'll be also talking about the exile. The Divided Kingdom comes on the heels of the United Kingdom, as I said earlier. King Solomon really had a downfall. The people knew this. A prophet by the name of Ahijah spoke to a man by the name of Jeroboam. And uh, the prophet told Jeroboam that he was going to eventually receive 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jeroboam, the word got out, and Solomon found out that this uh, word had gone forth to Jeroboam. Jeroboam headed south down into Egypt. Now, who's next in line to be the king of Israel? Well, it's Solomon's son, Rehoboam. After Solomon died, Rehoboam is ready to be the next king. But... Jeroboam is going to contest this. Jeroboam comes up out of Egypt after Solomon dies, and we have sort of a standoff at this point. You see, Solomon was very rough on the people towards the end of his reign. He did everything that Samuel said a king would do, tax them, take their children, and so forth. And the people, frankly, had had it. They had had it. So Jeroboam comes up out of Egypt, and he confronts Rehoboam, and they meet at a town called Shechem. It is at Shechem that Rehoboam and Jeroboam meet. And here's the way that the scenario goes. Jeroboam says to Rehoboam, what's it going to be? Are you going to be like your father? Are you going to be rough on us as the next king of Israel? Are you going to lighten up? Rehoboam goes to two sets of counselors. He goes to a set of younger, or regular, or rather older counselors who are his father's friends, and he says, what do you think I ought to do? Should I lighten the load on the people, or, or uh, should I tighten it? And the older counselor said, Rehoboam, you've got to lighten the load, or you're going to lose the people. Well, then, then Rehoboam goes to the younger counselors. These are the guys he grew up with, and you can well imagine these guys would like a seat uh, in the kingdom. And so Rehoboam says to them, what should I do? And they said, tighten it become harsher on them. And who does Rehoboam listen to? 
he listens to the younger counselors and he announces to the people that you thought my father was rough? You haven't seen anything yet. At that point, and I can't stress to you enough, this is so critical during 1 Kings chapter 12. This is a major watershed event in the history of the Bible. This is it. In 1 Kings chapter 12, the year is 930 B.C. If you look on the chart with me here, we have the divided kingdom, the year 930 B.C. Something so critical takes place. We have this standoff between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, is not going to give in. He's going to be just as harsh as his father and harsher. At this point in 930 B.C., you know what happens? The kingdom divides. The kingdom divides. It divides in 930 B.C. into two nations. Remember, we've had Saul, David, and Solomon, one nation, Israel. But in 930 B.C., at 1 Kings chapter 12, it divides into two nations, a northern nation and a southern nation. Look on the timeline with me once again. We have here in the divided kingdom a northern nation called Israel. I don't have the name Israel on here, but this northern fork is Israel. The southern fork is Judah. Rehoboam remains the king of Judah in the south. There's two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. In the north, we have the ten remaining tribes led by Jeroboam. Now, in the north, they're basically evil. They do not follow the Lord at all. In the south, we have Rehoboam leading Judah. This is the line that Jesus comes from. It's the line of, of Judah. Now, in the north, Jeroboam has a problem. He has just divided himself off from the central sanctuary in Jerusalem. So what is he going to do? He doesn't want the people to go down to Jerusalem because they will get mixed up with Judah in the south. And so what he does is he says, I am going to erect a golden calf, two of them in fact, one at Bethel in the south and Dan in the north. And he says to the people of the uh, north, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. So this, may, this split is very, very important. Now the split that takes place in 930 B.C. between the north and the south, if you don't understand that the kingdom split at this point, then I would dare say that the prophets are lost to you. Because this is also the period of time where the prophets come into the picture. Prophets like Amos, prophets like Hosea, Isaiah, Micah. And, uh, and on. So from this point on, we need to pay attention to what the prophets are saying. Are they speaking to Israel in the north, or are they speaking to Judah in the south? The, kingdoms of the, or the kingdom of the north under Jeroboam's rule is different than the south. In the north, we have a succession of nine, nine successive family dynasties. Nine successive family dynasties. Whereas in the south, with, Je with Rehoboam, we have one family dynasty. It's the line of David. And this is the line that Jesus will eventually come, come out of. We have 20 kings in the north. And we have 19 kings in the south. So we're reading the book of 1 Kings, we're reading 2 Kings, and it gets very, very complicated. And you know what complicates it even more? Look at the chart behind me. We have 1 Kings, we have 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, and 2 Kings. You may have read through these before. What complicates the Bible is when you start reading 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. You think, wait a minute, I've read that before. I, I'm all confused now. Well, let me straighten that out for you. When you're reading 2 Samuel, 1 Chronicles is a parallel book of 2 Samuel. 2 Chronicles is a parallel book of 1 and 2 Kings. But here's the difference. Chronicles, the chronicler, he chronicles the line of Judah in the south, the line of David, focuses primarily on the line of David. So next time you read through the Bible chronologically, you might want to go up and read 2 Chronicles while you're going through 1 and 2 Kings. Now, as I said earlier, the prophets are going to be lost to you if you don't understand that the kingdom divided in 930 B.C. Once again, look on my timeline chart. We have here in the north, the kings of the north, such kings as Omri, Ahab, Yehu, and Jeroboam II. We have prophets that come on the scene in the north, like Elijah, when he confronted the prophets of Baal. We have Elisha, Amos, and Hosea. In the south, we have kings like Asa, Jehoshaphat, Uzziah, Hezekiah and Josiah, and other prophets that show up like Isaiah and Micah and Obadiah. 
We're going to be talking with Dr. Hahn in just a few minutes about the book of Jonah during this period. At the end of the period of the divided kingdom, the prophets warned the north and they said, if you don't straighten up your act, God is going to deal with you. And we know, and we'll find out here by talking to Dr. Hahn, that the north was dealt with by Assyria. You see the kingdom divided in 930 BC. And why don't we go ahead and look at the chart once again, I think I can illustrate this just a little bit better. In the year, in the year 722, let's back up just a moment. In 930 BC, the kingdom divided into two nations, Israel and Judah. Okay, and this is during 1 Kings chapter 12. And then in the, in the year 722, the north did not get their act together. They were worshiping these gods at Bethel and Dan. They didn't get their act together. And Sargon II of Assyria comes down into the north and takes Israel out. Gone. But what's interesting is the Assyrian strategy was to bring conquests from other nations into the land and mix with the remnant of the north. Once he did that, once Sargon mixed with the uh, people from other nations with the remnant in the land, those people are known as the hated Samaritans. Those are the Samaritans. Well, in the south, the picture isn't much different. We have 19 kings in the south. Eight of them are good. One dynasty, eight kings are, 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 are pretty good. We'll talk about those probably a little bit later. But the, the program isn't that much different in the south. In the year 586, the south is taken away into captivity at this point. Now the captivity, or the, ex or the, uh, the exile period, takes place in three waves. There are three basic waves to this captivity. It starts off in the year 605. In 605, a, man, a young man by the name of Daniel is taken away from Jerusalem. Judah is in the south. Daniel is taken away into Babylon in the year 605. The second wave of captivity, you look here on the chart once again, the second arrow going up is the second deportation to Babylon. And Ezekiel, a young man by the name of Ezekiel, a prophet, was taken away in that second wave, and that was in the year 597. So the first wave is 605, the second wave, 597. Well, in the year 586, Jerusalem is destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes in and he destroys Jerusalem at that point. And so it, uh, there's, a, there's an apparent ruin. And you have to wonder, and we'll talk about this with Dr. Han, what is going on with our Father's plan right now? You know, we go through these periods where everything looks so good, and then suddenly there's a reversal. We'll discuss that. We'll take a look at some of the prophets. But I can't emphasize to you enough uh, the importance of understanding that in 930 BC, there's a rupture in the kingdom. And in order for you to understand all of these prophets, it's important for you to understand the north and the south. That is so important. I know that reading through the Bible myself for so long, I became so confused at this point. And in teaching this course, I taught this course at Franciscan University, many of my students would come up to me afterwards and they'd say, that one key has helped me out so much, knowing that the kingdom divided in 930 BC, two nations, and that the prophets are speaking to one or the other, usually. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment, and we're going to discuss this period of history, the divided kingdom and the exile, with Dr. Han on our, family, our Father's uh, plan for our lives. So we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Well, welcome back to our Father's plan. You know, that we just attempted, I just attempted, I should say, to do the impossible. And that is to explain in a few minutes this whole period of history called the Divided Kingdom and the Exile. Uh, the Divided Kingdom is a really a complicated period of time. It's first and second kings, the Divided Kingdom and the Exile. And I can't stress enough to you the importance of knowing that in 930 BC, the kingdom divided into two nations. And this is where the prophets come in. And uh, if you don't get a hold of that, then the prophets are lost to you. And the prophets are clearly a quarter of the Old Testament. And uh, so we want to talk a little bit about this divided kingdom period. Everything seemed to be, it was going smooth with uh, David. And you right. talked in our last program about how David was uniting, trying to bring the world together. And suddenly here, we have another major change. The kingdom divides in 930, First Kings. We've got two nations now, Israel to the north under the leadership of Jeroboam and Judah to the south under the leadership of Rehoboam. 
Dr. Hahn, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, I think the key is to see that Solomon is the hinge. Uh, in 1 Kings chapters 1 to 11, we read about the rise and fall of Solomon. We discover that divine wisdom is not really all we need. We need a new heart. And the problem is not just simply then in the head, it's in the heart. You, you see, Solomon had been given this divine wisdom and it filled his head with insight. But he needed something more. In the first four chapters or so, he is crowned king, he is endowed with the spirit, he is given divine wisdom to set up a government, to judge in disputes, and ultimately to build the temple, which is described in chapters 5 and following. The temple is, is more than just a church. The temple was sort of like a cathedral for the whole world to look to, to see God dwelling in the midst of all the nations again. This was the... This was the primary purpose we saw last week for the Davidic Covenant, that the son of David would be raised up to be a son of God, a firstborn, so that all the kings of the earth would see him as the king of kings. And not only a king, but a priest king, like the old Melchizedek back in Abraham's day, who united in himself the whole human family before the division between Israel and the nations began. So David longed to see this reunification. It began in Solomon and then it began to fall apart with Solomon because in 1 Kings 10 and 11, Solomon systematically breaks all three of the laws of the king that Moses had stipulated way back in Deuteronomy 17. In Deuteronomy 17, Moses said, if you want a king, and you will, you're going to want him for the wrong reason, as you said, to be like all the, na the other nations. Well, that's the wrong reason, but God will permit you to have a king so long as he doesn't do any of the following three things. First of all, he cannot multiply horses for himself from Egypt, that is to have a standing army, so that the basis of his kingdom is not God's wisdom, but the military strength of his armies. That is the kind of king that the other nations have. That's not the kind of king God wants Israel to have. The second prohibition is he must not multiply wives for himself, like all the other kings who built royal harems. Then the third prohibition is he must not multiply gold for himself. He broke all three. He broke all three. And in 1 Kings 10, 14 to 22, we read about how this type of Christ, Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, the, 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 the man with divine wisdom, the builder of the temple, how this man crumbles as a symbol of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Uh, the first thing in 1 Kings 10, 14 to 22, he begins to multiply gold for himself. In fact, he begins to squeeze these city states and nations under him of all the gold in their royal treasury so that every year they have to submit so much gold to him. In fact, it's 666 talents of gold. It's the only other time 600. besides Revelation 13, 18, where 666 is used, it's almost as though Revelation derives the image of the Antichrist from the beginning of Solomon's fall, from this Christ symbolism. So he's squeezing the nations of their gold. Then 1 Kings 10, 26 to 29 describes how Solomon goes and multiplies horses for himself. He builds up a standing army, and in fact, he goes all the way down to Egypt to get the best horses and chariots, exactly to contradict the Mosaic prohibition. And then finally, in 1 Kings 11, verses 1 to 8, we discover that Solomon took to himself 700 wives <laughs> and 300 concubines. Now, you might think, what is this man's problem? Uh, but you have to realize, from Solomon's perspective, those 700 wives are 700 diplomatic covenant treaties. That's the way you formed a treaty alliance. So he, he obtained these lives, uh, wives through alliances with other nations. Exactly. These princes and kings from other nations would send their daughters to marry Solomon. That's the way you enter into diplomatic treaties. So these weren't, treaties. These weren't wives in the sense of you and Kimberly. Necessarily. Yeah, presumably not. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly not with the 300 concubines added to the 700. In any case, by the end of chapter 11, 1 Kings has presented the rise and now fall of Solomon till he is corrupted by the idolatry of his foreign wives, till he has become a symbol of the Antichrist. He has taken all of these divine graces and now corrupted and perverted them for his own selfishness. Th that's an interesting concept because what you're saying is that Solomon starts off as the son of David, ends as an, a type of Antichrist. Yes. He has perverted the gifts of God and the corruption of the best, which is what Solomon was, becomes the very worst. 
And, and this is what we're seeing. And this leads up to the divided... Exactly, divided. because when Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam has, <laughs> has mixed signals. You know, Solomon's advisors advise his son Rehoboam, don't follow this path. This is a path to disaster. But Solomon's younger advisors give him the advice that you mentioned earlier. That is, hey, tell him you ain't seen nothing yet. You thought my father was tough. I'm much tougher. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a prescription or formula for disaster. And it is really what precipitated the Civil War, the split between the North, the ten tribes up north, and the South, the two tribes down south under the kingship of the, the Judahite monarch. And from this point on, we see the fulfillment of everything Moses had revealed in Deuteronomy. We spoke earlier about how Deuteronomy sets the program for the subsequent history of Israel. And in fact, some scholars call it the Deuteronomistic history, because from Joshua and Judges through 1st and 2nd Samuel and all the way to the end of 1st and 2nd Kings, we have the rise and fall of the Israelite kingdom until finally it eventuates in exile in slavery, in captivity. You go back and read Deuteronomy, it's exactly what God told Moses and what Moses then told Israel. That you've got blessings for obedience and you've got curses for disobedience and you're going to obey for a while, but your disobedience is inevitable. Hmm. And so the curses are not just threatened in Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30. They're guaranteed. They're announced as inevitable. And we're seeing the playing out of that now. That's right, because the greatest climactic curse of all is, in Deuteronomy 28, exile. You will be sent back as slaves to Egypt, among other nations, such as Babylon. And so, here in First and Second Kings, we see what another group of scholars refer to as Israel's damnation history. <laughs> you know, in effect, you're seeing Israel being accursed. Now, why is that? Is God the Father forsaking his family? No. This is fatherly discipline. Now, you might say that's an extreme form of chastisement, <laughs> but you're right. You know, when sin takes extreme forms, so must the punishment. And along with these sins, then, God sends wave after wave of the prophets, beginning with Elijah and Elisha, and then, as you mentioned, the other prophets, the writing prophets who were sent to the north, Hosea and Amos. And one of my favorites is Jonah. <laughs> well, what's interesting about Jonah, and I'd like to talk about Jonah for, sure. for just a moment, Jonah was sent up to Assyria, and Assyria is going to come down in destroy Israel in 721, 722. Yeah. So Jonah goes up to Assyria before God, you know, God uses Assyria to deal with Israel. That's a critical point, I think, for understanding Jonah. Because, you know, Jonah as a prophet undoubtedly knew God's plan. The plan was to use Assyria to chastise Israel. Now, Jonah is a patriotic Israelite. He loves his people even though he knows they're sinful. He, when, so when he gets the message from God, go to Nineveh, and preach a message saying, in 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. Wow. You know, a message of repentance. 40 days from now, you're going to be destroyed That's unless you repent. That is a whale of a story. Yeah, <laughs> in a manner of speaking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, before we get any more fishy humor here, <laughs> let's get back to Jonah's response. Because how would Jonah, as a patriotic Israelite, respond to a call from God? Go preach to Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, the military empire destined to conquer your own people in just a matter of years. Mm -hmm. Go preach to them a message of repentance. Well, suppose go, you know, go back to the early 90s, the Gulf War. Suppose you had the gift of prophecy and God came to you and said, Jeff, go to Baghdad and preach a message to, uh, to Saddam Hussein saying, in 40 days from now, your city will fall. God will destroy it because of your sins. Now, you know, if you're a typical American, you'll probably hop on the next plane to Alaska mm -hmm. and make sure that you get to Baghdad in precisely 41 days. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in other words, you're not interested in giving them a second chance. Right. If God is going to destroy them, why do I need to preach? Jonah knows if they survive, God will use Assyria, Nineveh, to chastise, to destroy my people. So what does he do? He's not a cowardly prophet. He's a patriot. He hops on the next ship to Tarshish, moving in the opposite direction from Nineveh. <laughs> Exit, stage left. <laughs> yeah, exactly.
Here comes the storm, and the sailors are wondering why. Jonah tells them, and so they throw him overboard, and the great fish swallows him. It doesn't say a whale, by the way. A great fish swallows him, and this is where people have a lot of trouble understanding or appreciating the message of Jonah because they wonder how can men, you know, how can a man be in the belly of a great fish for three days? And some defenders of the faith point out what is in fact true, that, that people have survived inside mm -hmm. of gr large fish for two or three days. But I think they missed the point uh, because in, in, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus speaks of the sign of Jonah. What is the sign of Jonah? You know, the sign of Jonah is being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights like the Son of Man will be in the earth for three days and three nights. But I think there's something more to it than that. I think, in fact, that there's a lot more to it than that. And when we come back in just a minute, we're going to take a look and see how Jonah's situation really does prefigure Christ's own. We'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> Welcome back to Our Father's Plan. If you just joined us, we're in the middle of a discussion right now uh, with Dr. Scott Hahn. We're talking about the period of the divided kingdom, and we're talking about the prophet Jonah going up to Assyria and prophesying to Assyria. Why don't we pick up where we left off? Yeah, the, the question we were dealing with is how would Jesus have understood his own usage of the sign of Jonah when he used that in speaking to his own contemporaries? If you go back to Jonah, you realize, of course, that he wasn't really a cowardly prophet. He was a patriotic prophet who was willing to lay down his own life for his countrymen. Because, in effect, by fleeing in the opposite direction, by not going to Nineveh, mm -hmm. Assyria, but by heading for Tarshish, he was saying, in effect, throw me overboard. I'd rather die than go to Nineveh and preach a message of repentance which will have its effect and cause the Assyrians to repent so that God doesn't have to destroy them in 40 days. Instead, he will then be able to use them to chastise, to uproot, to destroy my own fellow Israelite countrymen. So here's a prophet willing to lay down his life. So when he's thrown overboard, what happens? Well, he's swallowed by the great fish. But I don't think we have, to, we have to solve the problem of how could he have survived in the fish for so long, or how could the fish have gotten indigestion and coughed him up there in Nineveh, which isn't really close to any ocean. I think what happens is more miraculous, and I think the book of Jonah suggests as much. This is my own interpretive opinion, but when you read Jonah's prayer, prayed from the belly of the fish in Jonah 2, he doesn't speak about the belly of the fish. In verse 2 he says, out of the belly of shale I, crawl, I cried. That is the underworld, mm -hmm. the netherworld. And he goes on to talk about, in verse 6, how he's praying to the Lord to bring up my life from the pit. In other words, there are some suggestions here that what Jonah experienced was not just the indigestion of a big fish, but a sort of death. Hmm. Then coming up, out of, you know, coming after coming up after three days, wouldn't just be you know indigestion. It would be a kind of resurrection or a resuscitation, which reminds us of the sign of Jonah as Jesus speaks of yeah. it. And so when he comes out again, he finds himself there in Nineveh, and finally, somewhat reluctantly, he begins to preach the message, and it has its full effect. The king of Nineveh hears it rises up, takes off his robe, covers himself with sackcloth and ashes, and proclaims three days of repentance, fasting. And it has its effect because God's wrath is averted, the decree of destruction is lifted, and Jonah responds how? Well, what's baffling for many people is Jonah chapter 4. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Well, why would he be angry if they repented? Yeah. Now we understand because he knows that their repentance means their survival, and their survival points to their usefulness okay. by God in chastising Israel. And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger. In other words, <laughs> I knew you were going to do this. I was afraid your mercy might extend beyond the Jews and Israel even to the Assyrians, who were, in a sense, the most terrible people of the day. They used shock tactics in destroying people, decimating populations. And so, John had every reason, humanly speaking, to make Nineveh the last spot on his prophetic itinerary. And he says to the Lord, I knew you'd do this. 
and you did it. And now they're spared. And within 40 years, Nineveh turns on Israel, Jonah's own country, and destroys it utterly. So what do we have? A perfect sign of Jonah for Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't affect what Jonah did. That is, Jesus preaches a gospel, not just to his countrymen who he wants to spare. He lays his life down for his, for his countrymen, but he also goes and proclaims the gospel to the Gentiles until the wicked Romans hear it. They repent so that God spares them, even though, you know, despite their wickedness. And 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, Rome is used by God in a way that's remarkably similar to how God used Nineveh and Assyria to bring covenant judgment and punishment upon the Jews in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. That is so significant. I believe we need to understand it much better. Okay, that's, that's Jonah. That, that's an exciting uh, look at Jonah. I've, n- I've never heard that before, and that is exciting. Can we go into some of the major prophets? We think about Isaiah, we think about Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Yeah, how do they fit in the Father's plan? That's a good question. I think it's important for us to realize that the major prophets point us to the Messiah in a twofold manner. On the one hand, they have the Davidic kingdom representing the golden age in Israel, and they use that as a model of what the Messiah will come to restore and perfect. On the other hand, they have the Mosaic covenant to fall back upon, and great events such as the Exodus and great figures like Moses. And so the prophets also have recourse to how the Messiah will bring about a new exodus from the exile, from the captivity and slavery experienced by the Jews in the Babylonian captivity. And you'll see, going back and forth in Isaiah, in, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel and Daniel, this uh, back and forth twofold pattern here. For instance, in Isaiah, we have the famous Emmanuel prophecy running from Isaiah 7 through 11. We have in Isaiah 7 the famous prophecy concerning the virgin shall conceive and bear a, a son. And this prophecy, if you study it in context, reveals how God will miraculously preserve the Davidic dynasty even when it seems to be in ruins. And then you move on to Isaiah 9. You can see there in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of of peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it. Well, Isaiah is giving prophecies of the restoration of the Davidic Empire at a time when it's in a state of ruins. Mm -hmm. Likewise, in Isaiah 11, the climax of the Emmanuel prophecy, you have, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Who's Jesse? David's father. And it's a stump now because David's family tree has apparently been cut down. So, you know, how is there any hope for the Davidic kingdom to be restored? Well, only with God. And God will, as it were, bring forth a shoot, a branch from the stump of Jesse. And branch becomes actually a title given to the Messiah later on. In the other end of Isaiah, from Isaiah 40 to 66, however, we have not so much the Davidic covenant being emphasized. Instead, in Isaiah 40 to 66, the second half of Isaiah, we have the imagery of the new exodus. And we have four servant songs in which the servant of the Lord is the agent of the new exodus. And the servant of the Lord is described in many terms, but I'm convinced that my former professor and good friend, Gordon Hugenberger, has put his finger on the identity of the servant of the Lord. Most of all, of course, it's Jesus Christ. He fulfills it perfectly. But the terms and the images used throughout these four servant songs of Isaiah actually point to the agent of the new exodus. Well, if it's a new exodus, then you'd expect a new Moses, just like Moses predicted. Back in Deuteronomy again, chapter 18, verses 15 to 18, you have Moses saying, there will come a prophet who's greater than the other prophets. He'll be a prophet like me. He'll be a prophet like unto Moses, and he will deliver the people of God. And so Isaiah 40 to 66 presents all of the imagery of the new exodus accomplished by the servant of the Lord. And of course, Moses was the servant of the Lord, the faithful servant par excellence. Now, of all those servant songs, the fourth servant song is the most important one and the one we know the best. 
It's found in Isaiah 52, beginning in verse 13, going all the way through Isaiah 53, verse 12. We can't possibly do it justice. But we can point out how here in this prophecy we have a picture not of the conquering reigning king in the Davidic line, but of the suffering servant of the Lord who, like Moses, had to lay his life down for his people. He couldn't even enter into the promised land as such. But this servant, of course, is much greater than Moses. And by the way, I should mention in Acts 3, verses 21 to 26, Peter makes a big thing out of Jesus being the fulfillment of this prophet like unto Moses in Deuteronomy. 18. But in Isaiah 52 and 53, we read about our Lord. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God. And it goes on, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, but for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. And it goes on describing how Jesus Christ will suffer and atone for our sins. We can't get into it, but it's enough to say this, that this one prophecy, more than any other, has been responsible for opening up the spiritual eyes of many Jewish people to see that Jesus is truly their Messiah, as well as the Messiah and Savior of the world. For instance, we have the chief rabbi of the, uh, the synagogue of Rome back in 1945, Emil Zoli, who you know was the, uh, the head of the rabbi, he was the head rabbi in the uh, synagogue of Rome, and at the end of the war, he converted and became a Roman Catholic, and he also became the principal scripture scholar at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. And he points to this particular prophecy of Isaiah and says, this is what led me to my belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. So in Isaiah, we have the Davidic and the Mosaic. We have the, the kingdom, but we all have it being realized through a new exodus. Likewise, in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah describes how the Messiah will come and be the new David. And yet in Jeremiah 31, in announcing the new covenant that God will make after those days, he says, it won't be like the covenant that I made with your fathers in the wilderness, the covenant which they broke, it will be like a new covenant because I'll write the law not upon stone tablets. I'll write the law upon their hearts. I'm going to give them new hearts, as it were. And so borrowing the imagery from the Exodus there in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah shows how a new Exodus is ultimately needed to bring about the restoration and the perfection of the Davidic kingdom. This also is going back to Deuteronomy because in the Song of Moses, this is exactly what Moses predicted, that when you are sent into captivity to all those nations, you are going to be brought back in a new Exodus by the Lord. But when you come back, you're going to bring the nations with you. God will redeem the nations with you. And so Isaiah has that to fall back upon. Mm -hmm. It's the Davidic and the Mosaic. Jeremiah too, it's the Davidic and the Mosaic. Likewise in Ezekiel, on the one hand, Ezekiel 34, a very important prophecy of the shepherd Messiah, mm -hmm. who's actually referred to as my servant David there in Ezekiel 34, verse 23. And then in Ezekiel 36, we have once again, Imagery that draws from a new exodus. Imagery that points to the work of a prophet like unto Moses. There uh, it describes how this clean water will be sprinkled upon God's people. It will give them new hearts, a new spirit I will put within you, a new covenant I will make. And I will bring you out of the lands that you're captive, and I will bring you back to the promised land. And I will bless not only you, but all of the nations as well through you representing the, the real fulfillment of our Father's plan. Now, you asked about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. and Daniel. Now, we only have a few minutes left to look at Daniel. We really can't do him justice, but there are three chapters that would really call for good study. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 9. 2, 7, and 9. Yeah, 2, 7, and 9. In Daniel 2, we have Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar was the emperor in Babylon who had conquered Jerusalem. And in the midst of his reign, he has this nightmare. Mm -hmm. And Daniel interprets this dream for him and says, your dream points to four consecutive Gentile empires. Okay. The gold, which is you, Babylon. The silver, which will be the Medo-Persian empire that follows Babylon. Then you have the bronze, which will be the Greek empire under Alexander the Great. We'll get into that next time. And finally, you have the iron, which points forward to the Roman kingdom. And at that point, 
A stone will come and become a mountain that fills the earth, and that represents the kingdom of God, which will be established at the end of these four kingdoms. Now, how long will it take? What will it be like? Daniel 7 answers that. In Daniel 7, Daniel has another vision. These four Gentile kingdoms are described not as four metals, but as four hideous beasts. And each one becomes worse than the preceding one, until the fourth beast, which again represents Rome, is overcome by one like the Son of Man. The Son of Man come to the Ancient of Days, and it is through the Son of Man's suffering and obedience that God will bring about a transformation that will replace these four Gentile empires once again with the kingdom mm -hmm. established by the Son of Man. Yeah. Well, Daniel's wondering, how long will it take? In Daniel 9, it's revealed. In Daniel 9, we discover that after the period of time when Jerusalem's restored, the temple's rebuilt, there will be 77s or 490 years in which God will give the Jews a chance to repent again. And at the end of those 490 years, what will happen? Well, God is going to do the final work. It says this, that a, 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 a Messiah an anointed one shall be cut off, verse 26, and shall have nothing. And the city and the sanctuary shall be destroyed. And its end shall come with a flood, and desolations are decreed. But he shall make a strong covenant with many. Sacrifices and offerings will cease until the city and the sanctuary are desolated. What is this pointing to? The coming of the anointed one, the Christ. Mm -hmm. The destruction of the old covenant. The destruction of the old Jerusalem. The destruction of the old temple. Sure. And the replacement with a new covenant. The Son of David will come and bring about a new exodus, an interior spiritual deliverance from the interior bondage of sin. And this is what Jesus Christ accomplished at the end of days, at the end of the old covenant. Christ comes to fulfill all of these prophecies, the ones in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jonah, and all of the other minor prophets as well. Mm -hmm. Christ comes to restore and perfect the Davidic covenant by taking it into the heavenly Jerusalem, and he does so by bringing about a new exodus as the prophet like unto Moses, bringing the people into the ultimate promised land, not that chunk of turf known as Canaan, but that eternal dwelling place we call heaven. This is the significance of the Catholic Church. It is the worldwide family. Mm -hmm. It is the new Israel, the new kingdom, the new Jerusalem. And as Catholic Christians, we need to study the Bible to really appreciate all of the heritage that God has given us through Christ. If we do, we'll not only be more thankful, we'll be more contagious and effective in sharing our faith with other people on the basis of its scriptural rootage. Because we, as Catholic Christians, are Bible Christians. We'll come back next week and look at more of our Father's plan in salvation history. Thanks for being with us. <laughs> Sera de mi unis cum ti.